him over the uh hi Arnold. Hi Mickey. Good evening, good evening. Hello everyone. Hello. We'll wait for a couple others to at least. Oh yes, come. wait wait for a few more minutes. Yes, it's Jewish time after all, I imagine. Uh, Jewish time Montreal, Jewish time Vancouver. It's uh, it's <laughs> seven thirty, it's not seven thirty. No, it's ten thirty for you. I remember once going to a a wedding at the actual time that the wedding started and the family hadn't arrived yet. Never mind, no other guests. When the family arrived, I was there to greet them. And it was Harold who suggested we have to go be on time. I said, no, 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 no. On time, the hoop is not coming for another hour, hour and a half. So on time, can't really be on time, especially for a wedding. Here as a, as a rabbi in Vancouver, I can tell you that weddings start on time here. Really? Because, because the caterer is very upset <laughs> if you are not on time because uh -huh. the salmon will get overdone. Oh, okay. Okay, there's a thought. There's something so I never considered. Things are falling behind schedule. The salmon uh -huh. is gets overdone and... Uh, yeah. yeah, so then people will complain. Yes, that's yeah. true. So that is a that is a huge problem here in, in Vancouver for a wedding. <clears throat> yeah, and you have very good salmon out there in uh, Vancouver. What a yeah. gorgeous city. What's that place up on the uh, mountain you have near the, uh, where there's the bird sanctuary and, uh, where is that? Where there's birds and, and plants. Uh, and oh, there's a rest Queen Elizabeth Park. Yes, yes. And there's a restaurant there where they said the restaurant was closed, but the bar is open. So they showed me the bar and the view of, I said, you've got to be kidding. It was breathtaking, gorgeous. Yeah. Absolutely. Whoa. Amazing. Um, so we'll give it one more minute and then we'll start. Okay, sure. I'm ready to go. Those who I'm are ready to go when you are. I don't want the I don't want the salmon to be overcooked, Rabbi. Exactly, exactly. And I I understand your friends at the Garraways. Uh, yeah, my friend Lillian is friends with the uh, Garraways. Oh, yeah, she, yeah, she <laughs> wants to make sure that I I get Garraways. them in. Got it. Yeah. Lillian's a devoted fan and it's all and I'll, I'll get to the story and if I don't I'm sure she'll remind me about uh, how she got me started on a career of uh, on a writing career we'll get to that there'll be lots of fun stories uh, to share uh, a funny evening coming up so you know I think we'll begin uh, sure. if that's okay because Sorry. it's the you know we don't it's 733 and I mm -hmm. actually like the, I'm one of the only rabbis in the world who likes to start on time. So, you no, know, and I, I only recently have had an opportunity to meet uh, Tommy on online and haven't yet had a chance to meet him in person. But uh, Avishai just found out actually that he and Avishai are planning to do a, a program together as well called Sons of Rabbi. So, um, yeah. So it's going to be a great program online and hopefully Avishai will enjoy it. But uh, for those of you who are from, from Quebec or from Montreal, you know that Tommy's a, a famous personality there and has um, a long history of humor and writing. And we're lucky to have him join us in Vancouver. And we were able to save, um, we were able to do this without without paying Air Canada, thanks to COVID. And uh, and we are, we're lucky to both, I think tonight laugh with Tommy and as well learn from him as there's some serious material as well related to the book that he has written. And as the, he is, this, I am, I am the, the father of the son of a rabbi and he is the son of a rabbi. So that is one connection that we have in common. And he has written a book and I have read books. And so, 
Um, the other, the other thing is apparently he used to, he used to be one of the well-known people in, in Montreal um, who spread information about celebrities and some believe I'm a celebrity. So there we have another connection as well. So I pass it over to you, Tom. Thank you very much, uh, Rabbi. It's uh, an honor to see all of you, an honor to be uh, speaking uh, to the members of Beth Israel in beautiful uh, Vancouver. Uh, I was fortunate enough uh, to be in your town last year. I was a guest of the wonderful Vancouver Jewish uh, Book Festival uh, last year, and it was 2020. So last year, I got to go there in person and hang out with people like Gary Steingart, and Leonard Bernstein's daughter. So what do I have lined up for you uh, this evening? I'm going to fill you in on an amazing lady who I knew quite well. Uh, she was my mother. So a toast to, to mom, L'chaim. You will hear how she managed to get two notorious Nazis to save her life, but the memoir called Makeup Tips from Auschwitz, How Vanity Saved My Mother's Life. You can see it on over this shoulder. See the red matches the red. There's two copies over the, the right shoulder, two copies over the left shoulder. Uh, the book also tells about the impact her experience had on the relationship uh, that we had. I'll also share what it was like uh, as a six-year-old escaping from Hungary in the middle of the night. But before, before I even start, I want to share with you a couple of stories um, uh, to give you a, a taste of mom's uh, character. Now, uh, as the rabbi mentioned, I'm a son of a rabbi. My mother was the wife of a rabbi, and she was um, in charge of selling the, uh, the, the tickets for the high holidays. Now, the very first time I talked about this book, this memoir, it was at a synagogue in a suburb of Montreal. And before the rabbi introduced me, uh, a guy came up on stage and he said, you know, uh, we're just before Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, we're just before the high holidays. Uh, we, uh, we know, you know that tickets can be uh, expensive. You're saying it's just for three days, but we want to remind you that we're here for you, not only for the three days, we're here for you all year. Uh, and how important it is to be a member of the synagogue and to buy the tickets. Uh, that, he said that, then he introduced the rabbi who introduced me. When I heard this, I changed the beginning of my presentation because it reminded me of a story about mom. I mentioned to you that mom was in charge of selling the tickets. So she was the one who, you know, she had these little cardboard, she put in the name, what seat everybody had, you know, she did all that. And one day she gets a phone call. Hello, Mrs. Schnurmacher, I would like to buy tickets for the high holidays, but I don't want to be there for the whole thing, you understand. I want to come just for the Yisker. How much are the tickets if I come just for the Yisker? So uh, my mother replies, I'm going to answer you, but first I have to tell you, my mother says, you know what, before I tell you uh, the answer, you know what, I love the movie Cleopatra. Do you know why I love it? I love it so much because of Richard Burton and Elizabeth Taylor. When they are kissing the love scene, it's so beautiful. If I go to the Van Horn Theater and I tell them, I want to see just the love scene, then how much is the ticket? That's, that's, my, that's my mom. I'll give you another indication of uh, her character. Mom uh, and dad lived in a duplex, right? They lived downstairs. Upstairs was the tenant. And one day the uh, phone rings Mrs. Schnurmacher, there's no heat. Move to Florida, my mother says. Hangs up. The woman calls again. Mr. Schnurmacher, I'm your tenant. I just told you there's no heat. Well, don't walk around naked like a tzatzkele and close the window. 
it's still not over. The woman calls the police. The police arrive. They ring the bell. My mother goes to the door. Yes. Mr. Schneermacher, we have a complaint. What's the complaint? Your tenant. Your tenant says that there's no heat. What are you? The heat police. Go catch a crook. And my father, uh, my father chimes in. Who was that? My mother says, somebody selling chocolate. So just you're giving, getting a, an indication of mom's uh, character. Now, she was a, mom could be a, a, a tough cookie. Now, wh where did that, where did that come from? Let's go back. Let's go back a few decades. A little shtetl, a little small town in Hungary, in rural Hungary. Mom is walking along with her sister and she's telling her sister that she's they're bored nothing exciting nothing different is happening in their life this is in 1944 early 1944 in hungary within a few months of that conversation they're on board a cattle car on a train heading to auschwitz now I want you to know when when people, especially people who, who aren't Jewish or who aren't familiar with, with the history, think of, oh, going on a train somewhere, they think of, of a train like you and I think of a train getting on the train and there is your seats and you're sitting comfortably in your seats. This is not what we're talking about. We're not talking about a passenger train. We're talking about a cattle car. We're talking about horrific conditions for three, four days without food or water or a bathroom. It's a horrendous, horrendous situation. Uh, and my mother and her uh, brothers or sisters at different times are on these cattle cars going from their little towns, little shtetls in Hungary to Auschwitz. Now, my mother was also a proud woman. So listen to this, what happened when she arrives in Auschwitz. Because the message, obviously, from the Nazis to my mother or to, to everybody else who was there on the train, you're nothing. You mean you are lower than low, you have zero value, you're subhuman, you don't count. That was the, the message clear, stated and unstated. And my mother was a proud woman and she did not, she absolutely did not accept this message. She said, I do matter, I do count. And this is what she did when she arrived get this, she didn't like the outfit they gave her. We're talking in Auschwitz. She didn't like the way it looked. She didn't like the way it fit. She, she was vain. She wanted to look good even there, even in that horror. So what did she do? She took her daily ration of bread, exchanged it for needle and thread, and sewed it up, sewed up the outfit so it fit properly. The swill that they served her as coffee, she didn't drink it. She took it and used it to polish her shoes so they were shiny. She pinched her cheeks to look red. So she looked fine and everybody was saying, you can't do that. You can't single yourself out for any kind of attention. You shouldn't do that. Uh, and during the morning roll call, because the, the Nazis would count their Jews every single day, during the morning roll call, Irma Greza, one of the female commandants of Auschwitz, on whom they patterned the character Ilsa Shewolf of the SS, said, you, out of the line. And she asked my mother, how come a Jew, a dirty Jew looks like this in a place like this? So my mother told her the truth, told her exactly what she had done with the needle and thread, with the coffee. So there's a momentary pause. In that pause, Grace is thinking, a killer? I won't kill her. Like she, she can make either decision. She decides, oh, in, okay, if you're that case, if you're that clean, you can work as my housekeeper, my valet, my, my cleaning person. So my mother polished her bicycle, polished her shoes, tended to her garden, did that, that's what she did for her during the war. So this was the second Nazi who saved her life. The first one was Joseph Mengele, who saw her and she looked young and fit. And instead of sending her to the gas chamber, he sent her to the work division of, of Auschwitz. Now, so my mother goes through all of that. She goes through the Holocaust, 19, 
and is liberated in 1945. Decade later, the Hungarian Revolution. And in the middle of the night, a man comes knocking and says, your sister says uh, she's going to help you get out of Hungary with all the chaos going on of the revolution. Um, I must say, uh, how do I know who you are? And the guy takes out a picture, her wedding picture, because it was sent by her sister-in-law. So he, she knew this was a legit thing. So we had like a few hours to pack everything. And my mother tells me, you have a choice. You can only bring one toy with you. Now, my two favorite toys, think about, I'm five years old at this time, right? My two favorite toys were a wooden streetcar and a mandolin. And I figured the wooden streetcar, that doesn't do much. But I can play the mandolin. So I take the mandolin. Now, when we're crossing the border, what we're doing is we're escaping from Hungary, from communist Hungary, in the middle of the night on a, across a muddy field. In this muddy field, uh, there are landmines. There's barbed wire and there's landmines. And the landmines were placed there by these Hungarians, one of whom was called Jula. And you know what Jula did in his spare time once he placed all of the landmines? He asked money for people and he said he would guide them across the border so they could avoid the landmines. So we paid my parents and other group of other people, paid him some money and we're going quietly in the middle of the night to sneak across the border from Hungary into Austria, avoiding the landmines because he knew where we should go and where we shouldn't go. So I decided while this was all happening, I didn't know what was going on, but I had my mandolin. I thought, decided this would be a good time to strum a little, a few tunes on the mandolin. Well, Jula, the, our guide, takes my mandolin, smashes it over my head, and thus ends my musical career. Why? Well, of course, if, if the Russians who were guarding the border had heard something, they would have machine gunned us to death. So quiet was extremely important. So he didn't want me playing any music. We arrive in Montreal. We finally settle in Vienna for a few days. Uh, my uncle pays for us to fly from Vienna to Montreal. We go to Moncton, uh, we take a train, we get to Montreal and we arrive. And so mom and dad and I are now in Montreal as refugees from Hungary. Uh, we speak fluent Hungarian but we don't speak a word of English or a word of French. Not a good thing uh, in uh, Montreal. So it's my first day in class at Bancroft School on Clark Street. I don't know if any of you know Montreal. Uh, and there I am and the teacher is talking, which is very nice, but I don't understand a word of what she's saying because I don't speak a word of English. So I do what the other kids say. They sit there with their hands folded. I sit there with my hand folded. And then, uh, I see that everybody gets a piece of paper and I get a piece of paper and everybody gets a pencil and I get a piece of pencil. So far, so good. But then the teacher's talking, 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 and I see people picking up the pencil and they're going to write something. But what are they going to write? She's talking, the teacher, Miss Wadman, she's busy talking, but I don't know what she's saying. So what am I going to do? I look over at the girl sitting next to me and she's picking up her pencil and she's taking it up to the upper right hand side of her piece of paper and she's writing m a r i e Aha. so i pick up my pencil and i write m a r i -E. E. So now I did what everyone's supposed to do. Of course, I had no idea it was her name. Now, you think that was something? I find out that the Jewish Public Library, you could become a member of the library. That means you were allowed to take out three books to read as a refugee I'm hearing is. You can read not one, not two, but three books, but you have to become a member of the library. Oh, how much does it cost to become a member of the library? five cents. Did you hear that? Five cents. That's okay. I have five cents. I can become a member of the library. I'm absolutely thrilled. I take my nickel. I go up to the front desk. 
I hand it over to the librarian and I'm ready to take my three books. She says, you have to have your parents' signature on the card. Oh, so close, but so far. But my parents aren't coming home till later that afternoon. I could practically taste the books. I was so happy I couldn't wait to read. And uh, I figured I've got to do something. So you know what I did? I went out of the library. I went to the corner of St. Urban and Mount Royal in Montreal. And I asked one adult after another to forge my mother's signature. And most of them said no, 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 no. Then I saw one lady who had sort of like a hippie uh, hairdo. And I asked her, I said, please, at this point I was pleading. And so I slowly spelt it out for her, because as you can see on my face, it's a long name, Schnurmacher, S-C-H-N-U, I took a while. She forged the signature and I got my card. And that was a wonderful story. And I was, I've been a member ever since and borrowing books ever since. Uh, they taught, I was uh, emceeing an event for them and I admitted the, the crime, admitted being a criminal and having forged the signature decades ago. Now, when I was in grade one, after I copied Marie's name and finally I started speaking English, I started getting along better in class. But one day I forgot my lunch. So the teacher, Miss Wadman, said that she would take me to Bancroft Snack Bar to have lunch. She says, uh, Tommy, would you like a hot dog? Hot dog? They can't actually serve dogs to eat in Canada. I mean, even Canada, they're not gonna eat, not gonna eat dog. Must be, uh, it's a candy. It's probably like a funny, it's they, what they think is like a funny name for a candy. That's what it is, not a dog. And so, uh, I said, sure, I'll have a hot dog. So she orders the hot dog and it arrives. And I said, oh, it's meat. It's probably not kosher. I can't eat it, but I can't say no because she's going to be upset. What am I going to do? I said, Miss Wadman, what does that mean over there? She looks up at the sign while she's looking up there. I throw the hot dog on the floor quickly. Huh. Oh, that was good. Oh, you must be so hungry. Do you want another one? No, 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 I don't want another one. Thank you, thank you, thank you. On another occasion, again, in the same realm of the experience that you get when you come to, to Canada as a newcomer, as a refugee, as an immigrant, I go upstairs to visit a friend. He's Ukrainian and he's having lunch. He's having a steak. He tells his mother he's thirsty. So his mother goes to the fridge. fridge. She opens the fridge door she takes out a bottle of milk. She comes over to the table. She's pouring him the milk. I see he's having a steak. The milk, the milk. I knock the milk off the table. I run out screaming, running to my mother that she's got to call the police. You have to call the police. The lady upstairs, she wants to kill her son. I saw it myself. She's trying to poison him. He's busy having a steak. He's going to have the milk. The milk and the meat are going to mix and he's going to die. Again. You know, don't, as a little kid, you don't quite know what's going on. So that's what happened. And it took me a while to figure out what happened. I eventually, you know, learned how to speak uh, English. And as I was growing up, what I wanted to do was very important for me to do. I wanted to do, to, to undo the Holocaust, right? As a, as a child, right? Of course, you can't undo the Holocaust, but I became very protective of my mother. As a child of immigrants, I spoke English before they did. They didn't know how to deal with government. I did. I'm the one who did the translation. So I was very overprotective of them. Now, they it all started, of course, with them being overprotective of me. You want an example? Let me give you an example of what I mean by overprotective. We're in Canada. It's Montreal. What do young kids do in Montreal in the winter? They play hockey, right? So. Uh, and, and that's one of the things they do. But even before we get to anything to do with hockey, uh, one day, uh, mom says, you can't go to school today. Why not? It's too cold. What, what, what do you mean it's too cold? All the other kids are going to school. Everybody's going to school. All the other kids are going to school. How come they get to go to school and I don't? Why are they going to school? Because Canadian parents don't love their children. This is the message that she she gave me. That's why they allowed them uh, to do that. My father 
liked the idea that I wanted to play hockey. He saw everyone else was playing hockey, didn't have a lot of money, but he brought me skates, a pair of skates. Okay, you want to go with him to skate? I don't mind. He will go on the ice. He will fall on the ice. He will break his head. The skull will crack open like a cantaloupe and the blood will come out from the head soaking the red deep red blood soaking into the eyes spreading wider the red from the blood i'm hearing this i'm in tears i'm not going skating i don't want to play hockey and to this day i don't know how to skate i don't know how to ride a bike i've never gone bowling all of this all of this from the from the unbelievable overprotection and again, a combination of the overprotection, the chutzpah. In high school, I won um, a, um, a scholarship. And at the time, a scholarship meant a $10 gift certificate. And you go to Eaton's. You remember Eaton's? It was open in Vancouver years ago, open in Montreal years ago. I got a $10 gift certificate from Eaton's. And my friend Howard and his mom drove me down because Howard also got a $10 gift certificate. And we went uh, to pick up some books with our $10 at Eaton's in their book department. And we're driving home. On the radio, I hear that Tommy Schnurmacher has been missing for a week. And my friend's mother, Mrs. Carroll says, where have you been all week? So what do you mean, where have I been all week at home? She says, you go to school every day? I said, I went to school every day. What did you go out? What did you do when you after school? I said, I went home like I go home every night. Then why are they looking? Why are the police looking for you? I said, I have no idea. We come home, Mrs. Carroll knocks on the door. My mother, says, opens the door and says, oh, thank God he's alive. Thank God he's alive. A, a big hug. Mrs. Carroll said, why did you tell, why did you tell the police that your son was missing for a week? He's been here all week. Why did you tell the police your son has been missing for a week? You think if I tell them he's missing for two hours, they will go look for him? Again, an, an indication of, 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 uh, mom. Now, I was very spoiled. I mean, b by her and my dad. When I, when I wanted to have a uh, a Beatle album, uh, when Beatle Mania came out, I said, "Daddy, Daddy, could I please have uh, money to buy a Beatle album?" My father said, "Tommy, take it out of your allowance." I said, "I know, but I spent my allowance. Well, take it out of next week's allowance. I don't. I don't want to wait." He said, "Okay, okay." So he gives me the money and I buy the Beatle album. It's a fantastic, warm, wonderful memory I have of my, of my dear father, Allah Shalom. A great memory of him that he was so kind and he just couldn't say, he was all chesed, all kindness. He couldn't say no to me. Fast forward a few decades, he passes away. And whenever I'd go out with him as he was getting older, whenever we'd go anywhere to a synagogue or any function at all, I'd always say to him in Hungarian, Daddy, okay, Vaj, which means, Daddy, are you okay? He'd say yes. And a few minutes later, I'd ask him, Daddy, are you okay, Vaj? Are you okay? I'd constantly ask him that question, make sure he's okay, and he's fine. So I'm at the cemetery on, on the, the yurt site, and I'm asking, um, I'm looking down at the at, at the tombstone uh, at the Matseva and saying, Daddy, are you okay? And you know what happens? The music of Beatlemania starts playing in the cemetery. Now, how crazy is that? Not one song, one song after another. The entire album. Now, it's not some kind of miracle. What happens is there's a swimming pool adjacent to the Doll Art Cemetery in Montreal, and they were having a beach party and they were playing music. But the issue was, what music were they playing? The Beatles. One song? No, the entire album. And when were they playing it? The very second I said, Daddy, okay, watch. Are you okay? Now, as a kid, I love New York, and I mention New York a lot in the book. I love New York City, and it took me years and years and years of lobbying my mother to take me to New York City. And she took me there in 1965. I was 14 years old. We arrive at Grand Central Station. We have to go back. It's war. War has broken out. I said, no war has broken out. There's no war. Uh, everything is fine. We're going to stay. Okay. 
We're walking from Grand Central to 7th Avenue and 42nd Street uh, to the National Hotel. Don't look for it. It's long gone. It was $10 a night. It's long gone. It's been destroyed ages ago. But we're walking to New York and mom sees a brassiere store, a store that sells only bras. <gasps> She's fascinated by this. She said, Tommy, you wait here with the luggage. I go inside. She goes inside. I wait outside with the luggage. She buys a bra. She's thrilled. She's got her plastic bag, a bag with her brassiere. And off we go to the hotel. She goes into the bathroom, changes, puts on her bra, then comes out. She's taking it off. And she's told me it's back in the plastic bag. She says, it doesn't fit. Could you take it back to the store? I, I know where yeah, I'm smart. I know where the store is, but I don't think on you. I don't think they're going to take back a bra. I don't think they take back bras. Please die. So off I go walking down 7th Avenue till I get to the Brazier store. I walk in. Um, I'd like to return a bra. We don't take bras back. Are you the owner of the store? Yes, I am the owner of the store. How long has this store been here? Kid, this store has been here 25 years. So I said to him, in that 25 years, has a 14 year old kid ever come in asking to return his mother's bra? He says, okay, kid, okay, okay. Here's your money. Uh, no problem. So, uh, and by the way, when we, the, the whole reason we went to New York, the whole reason mom agreed to go to New York is because she knew that on 34th Street, there were dozens of women's dress shops that all had one sign in the window, all dresses $5, all dresses $5. And she looked at every dress in every single store and I had to tell her which size it was. Now, she had a deal. You know what the deal was? Now, when you take your kids, your grandchildren to New York, you're probably thinking, well, what can we do to make sure the kids have something fun to do, right? You really care about what they're going to do. Mom, no, no, not that interested in what I was going to do. Mom uh, said, this is the deal. For every time we go to seven stores, we go to one museum where you want to go. Seven stores equal one museum. I was 14. I didn't know if this is a good deal or not. I took the deal. And so we went to dress shop after dress shop after dress shop. And then I got to the Museum of uh, Natural History. She took a picture of me next to a cigar store Indian. She said, okay, enough, let's go. Uh, she was bored, she had enough. That was at the end of the uh, museum. Later on, I would take her back to, um, Century, back to New York to Century 21. And I saw a dress, get this, an evening dress that was $2,000, reduced to 1,000, reduced to 500, reduced to 100, reduced to $20. No, so like she didn't need the evening dress, but for, it's a it, it's a thousand, it's two thousand dollar dress for 20 bucks. So I said, on you, you have to buy this. So there I am kneeling down, asking her to put one leg into the dress. She puts in one leg into the dress, okay. Then, okay, now you have to put the other leg in. She puts in the other leg, but now the first leg has come out. Then I put in the other, now, this is becoming so ridiculous. I topple over, right? And she's holding on to a dress rack because she's half stuck in this $2,000 dress that's for sale for 20 bucks. Anyway, so um, in terms of her, her character, I remember once having gone to Atlanta and I went to the uh, Holocaust Museum. I don't know if you've ever been to the Holocaust Museum in Atlanta. And it, it's very small. And my mother had always told me that Greza had looked like uh, Ingrid Bergman. So I'm looking at the exhibits, I'm looking at the pictures and you know, uh, there's sort of sepia brown and see the names underneath. And I'm looking closely at the pictures and I see three women and one of them looks like Ingrid Bergman. So I read carefully underneath and it says Irma Greza. That's the woman, that's the woman, the Nazi commandant who saved my mother's life. So I'm like, Wow. I rushed to the phone to call her up. Guess what? I'm in Atlanta. I went to the Holocaust Museum. I saw, I saw a picture of Greza. You're in Atlanta. Did you go to CNN and the Coca-Cola Museum? See, mom had gone past that. She was not looking into the past. She was looking into the 
into the future. Now, you know that I was a um, radio talk show host for a few decades. I was a gossip columnist for the for the Montreal Gazette. I covered the Academy Awards, and I went to the uh, Oscars. And my mom was my date for the Oscars. Yeah. Now, so we get there. I have a press pass, right? Made out to me, Tommy Schnurmacher. And my friend, Denny, who works for the Associated Press, she says, Tommy, you know what? I'm only covering the arrivals and another reporter is going to cover the whole event. Once the arrivals are done, I'm going to give you my press pass. You can give it to your mom. Perfect. So there we are in front of the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion in Los Angeles, in downtown Los Angeles. And uh, I have my press pass and mom has a press pass that says Denny Arar on it. And all of a sudden, Denny comes back. She says, Tommy, I'm so sorry. The reporter who's supposed to cover the main event, he called in sick. I have to cover it. You have to give me the press pass back. Well, what could I do, right? It's her press pass. So I give it back to her. So mom and I are standing there together. I have my press pass around my neck. And so I wear it for a while. Then I uh, give it to mom and she wears it for a while. And then she gives it back to me. And all of a sudden, a six foot four Los Angeles cop comes up standing right in front of us and says, okay, which one of you two is Tommy Schnurmacher? Oh, officer, he is Tommy Schnurmacher. I don't have a press pass. It's my fault, but don't worry. I will walk home alone at night by myself in dangerous Los Angeles, and who knows what will happen, but don't you worry, I, I, I will walk home alone. Of course, he's charmed like crazy about all of this, and he puts his arm around her and escorts us over to where we can watch the arrivals with no uh, problem. I also, as a journalist, went to the Cannes Film Festival. Guess who was my date? Mom. And uh, wait, wait, before, uh, before we get to the Cannes Film Festival, when we got to the Oscars, when we went inside after the Oscars, the winner was Robert Redford, right? And uh, they bring the movie stars to the press room, the TV room first, then radio, then newspapers. So they bring us into the newspapers, sitting there with mom. Um, and uh, Robert Redford wins for Ordinary People, best uh, picture, best director. And they say, any questions from the media? It's a room full of press from the United States and from all over the world. And Robert Redford at the time is such a well-known, uh, such a prominent, such a big star, such a superstar. Everybody's nervous to ask the first question. Everybody except one short Hungarian lady, Ma. Excuse me, Mr. Redford. Now that you have won the Oscar, are you going to run for president? He was charmed by it. Robert Redford is charmed by her. So I also went, as I mentioned to you, I covered the Cannes Film Festival. And we're at the casino. I said, Anya, we can have fun at the casino. But you know at home when we play blackjack and you cheat and daddy and I think it's funny? Over here at this casino run by the government of France, they won't think it's funny. Uh, you don't want to see the inside of a French jail. You don't. Want to, so you make sure no cheating. She was very nice. She didn't cheat uh, at all. I took her out to a restaurant, the Moulin de Mougin in Mougin, France, not far from Cannes. A beautiful, elegant restaurant. She couldn't. And we had to take a taxi there. She couldn't understand why we're taking the taxi to a restaurant. Isn't there a restaurant near the hotel? Yes, but this is a special restaurant. We get to the restaurant. It's a gourmet five-star restaurant and we're ordering, etc. And then she spots the actor, Omar Sharif. She says, look, Omar Sharif. I said, shh, shh, shh. You, you can't bother them. You can't go over there. You can't ask for autographs. You can't bother the celebrities when they come to a, a restaurant like that. You know, they come here for their privacy. And their, as I'm explaining all this, of course, I'm talking to an empty chair. She's already gotten up and she is heading over to Omar Sharif. I said, oh my God, I'm so humiliated. I'm so embarrassed. What, what, like, what, what am I going to do? I look in the other, uh, I, I look away. I say, oh, they're going to throw her out. What am I going to do? This is so embarrassing. 
I slowly turn around, I look over there. I see Omar Sharif is going to another table. He's getting a chair and he's bringing over the chair to his table. So for mom to sit down with him at his table. That's not all, wait. The next thing I see is Omar Sharif's hand is in mom's hand and mom is doing this. She's, she's reading his palm. She doesn't read palms. She has no idea how to read palms. She's never done it before, but she knew enough to keep the hib entertained, etc. That That's my mom. By the way, I, I don't know how many of you play blackjack. Anybody here they play blackjack? Raise your hand if you've ever played blackjack or you know the game. Uh, uh, tell a, a quick, quick story. She, I took her to the Montreal Casino and uh, a lot of people had bet a lot of money. She, I was in the sixth place. She was in the seventh place and the dealers dealing the cards. And she gets uh, the, the object of the game is to get 21. So she has 17. When you have 17, you don't ask for another card because that's close to 21, right? So the dealer says, would you like another card? Uh, and everybody, you know, people are nodding, no. Yes. Are you sure? I said, what are you doing? I want another card. He hands her the card. It's a four. She gets 21. But wait, he had a 10, takes out the next card, the dealer, which is a 10. So he has 20. So which means mom has won. But because she took that four, the dealer would have 10, 4, 14, and 10, 24. The dealer would have gone over and everybody at the table would have won. But because of mom, the only one at the table who won was her. So I told her, we have to get out of here quick before all the other people who lost all this money are going to get very, very upset. Now, what did I, what did I, uh, what did I inherit from uh, uh, my mother? I inherited um, a great deal of, of this kind of, of, of gutsiness, uh, right? And, and, and chutzpah. When I was 18 years old, I heard that John Lennon and Yoko Ono were coming to Montreal for the bed in for peace. And so I called my friend Lillian, who's with us right now, and she told me she was too busy. That's what she told me. She's too busy. She has biology homework or something. So then I called another friend, Gail, and she said, I don't want to go. There are too many kids there. It's full of teenagers. There's going to be dozens of kids there. You'll never get in. I said, then we'll come home. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. So I talked her into it. I had my forged press pass. I, ha I knew that John and Yoko were here with Yoko's six-year-old daughter, Kyoko. And uh, my sister, uh, Cynthia, Elisham was six years old at the time. She, uh, and I asked her for crayons. I took her crayons. So off we went to the Queen Elizabeth Hotel where John and Yoko were there, uh, armed with my fake press pass and some crayons. We'd heard on the radio there on the 17th floor. We get to the hotel, nobody on the street, Nobody in the lobby, nobody there. We get in the elevator, Gail, an amateur. She wants to press 17. No, 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 no. You don't press 17. They're going to be on the lookout for that. 18. No one's on the lookout for anybody on 18. We go up to the 18th floor, no problem. Go to the staircase, down the stairs, the 17th floor, on the 17th floor, see a little fuss in one part of the room, and walk over there, and I knock on the door, and as the door opens, it's Yoko Ono with a little girl. At the same time, there's a security guard with his hand on the back of my neck. I'm so sorry, we're gonna throw these people out. And Yoko says, don't throw anybody out. These are our friends. And Kyoko says, can I have the crayons? I said, well, not if we're gonna be thrown out. Yoko says, no one's gonna be thrown out, come in. I give the little girl the crayons, we come in, and she tells me, Yoko says this to me. Remember, I'm a teenager at the time. Would you like to meet John? Would you like to meet one of the Beatles? Uh, yes, yes. And so I meet John. We, I interview him and Yoko. Then I started feeling bad for the little kid because no one told us to leave, so we didn't leave. 
I felt bad for the little kid being stuck there. So I said to Yoko, I said, you know what? Maybe I can take her to play. She's six years old. My sister's six years old. Maybe I can take the two of them to play together in the park. So they said, get this. This is a while ago. It wouldn't happen in 2021. They said, yes, I took Kyoko to play with my sister. We went with a cab back home, played in the park, took her back home. They didn't know our name. They didn't know our address. They didn't know our phone number. They entrusted us with their six-year-old daughter without knowing literally anything other than our first name. Very, very different times. So then what happened after that, uh, at the end, they gave us autographed pictures, $150 cash for babysitting. And uh, my friend Gail took the lyrics for Give Peace a Chance, which were in the room, and she later sold them for 350,000 pounds. How much of that did she share with me? I'm not gonna tell you that now, but the answer is in the book, or you could Google it, what happened to, to Gail and, and me and the friendship and, and, and the lyrics. So my mother gave me that, that gift for the chutzpah to do that at age 18. Should I tell you something else she gave me? The ability to catastrophize, to think of a bad situation, what's the worst that could happen? Because of course, in her case, the worst did happen, right? The, uh, in terms of what she went through. So I catastrophized, but then the positive side of it, in addition to the resilience and the chutzpah is, She's a survivor. She got through the most incredible things. She got through the Holocaust. She got through the Hungarian Revolution. She got through all, all of these things. So then when COVID hit, right, I could get through that. Now, what happened with, with, with COVID, I was, um, last year, I went to the Vancouver um, Jewish Book Festival, uh, came back, did a presentation in Montreal at my uh, radio station, and we were planning to go to Venice. And a friend of mine tells me, uh, on Saturday night, you know, there seems to be a problem in in uh, in Italy with with COVID. You better not go there. Um, uh, and as, uh, it's in the area of Veneto. So I tell uh, my partner Harold, I said, Veneto. Uh, well, anyway, that's we're going to Venice, nowhere near Venice. He said, Hello, Veneto. He says, Veneto is Venice. So. I, ha I have to cancel this beautiful Airbnb that I had on the Grand Canal. It was so difficult for me to do this hand, had to take this hand to push it to hit the cancel button. So now that we have the cancel button, if we're not going to Venice, let's go somewhere. Let's go to New York City. So we go to New York City. In New York City, they say there are no cases uh, at that time. I'm talking February, end of February last year. No cases in New York. And I'm thinking to myself, no cases in New York. This is a city where they have JFK Airport. That airport is so enormous, you can drive for 20 minutes and you still haven't passed the airport. Is it possible that of the thousands and thousands of planes that come in, not one of them has anyone with COVID? That's impossible. So we left New York came back to Montreal and I told friends, you know, go to Costco, stock up on toilet paper and, and tuna fish. By the way, I had tuna fish left over from Y2K. Like I, I always take extra, extra precautions. So I got from her the chutzpah, the, the resilience. And I thought to myself, what she went through, COVID, we're locked in. We can't see our friends. Yes, it's all terrible. But in the meanwhile, we have the food we want. We have what to drink. Uh, we can speak on Zoom. We have Netflix. We have Amazon. They deliver to the door. It, it got, it got, it helped me get me through. Now let me read you a little bit um, about. Uh, I'm going to read a little bit, a short chapter from the book, and then we can take uh, questions um, and answers. This uh, chapter of the book is called "The Last of the Hungarians." After mom had a regular checkup, her doctor suggested I might want to take her to the geriatric clinic for some tests. Why on earth would I want to take her to some geriatric clinic? She's not that old. She's certainly not geriatric. The doctor looked at me the way B. Arthur used to look at Betty White. I figured you were around 60 and since she's your mother, I jumped to the radical conclusion she's probably a bit older than you are. Everyone's a comedian. 
We left his office, but I did, however, decide to take mom to the clinic, not right away, you understand, about a year later. And after having her pulse checked, her blood pressure measured, mom was required to answer some questions. Do you know who is the Prime Minister of Canada? Yes, I do. All right, well, who is he? Stephen Harper, of course. You're a doctor and you don't know who is the Prime Minister of Canada? Maybe you're not a good doctor. I do know. I'm asking you these questions to see how good your memory is. My memory is excellent. I still remember going to Auschwitz where they shaved off my head and gave me a tattoo. What do you remember? This was not going well. I figured I better do something to distract mom. Uh, may maybe after this appointment, mom, we can go shopping. Do, do you want to go shopping? Yes, but first we have to finish with this doctor who has a bad memory. Just a, a few more minutes and we're done, madam. Here's a piece of paper and a pencil. Uh, write down a full sentence, any sentence that you like. Take your time. Mom took the pencil, looking at me, and wrote something on the paper and handed it to the doctor. Your mother had no problem writing a sentence. What did she write? I love my son. After the appointment, the doctor told me my mother was fine. She just had a mild case of dementia, nothing to worry about. What a quack. How could this man have mentioned my mother and the D word in the same sentence? Before I hired her live-in caregiver, there are quite a few I'd hired on a part-time basis, some more successful than others. Mom told one bossy caregiver she really didn't like that she should find other employment. I'm sure they would pay you big money to work in that circus and you get to travel. Why be stuck in Montreal with me? Most of the help I'd hired were from the Philippines. One morning, however, I bumped into a kind, smiling gentleman who'd been good friends with my dad. He ran an agency that provided caregivers on a part-time basis. And he told me about Iboyo, who had just arrived from the Hungarian countryside. She spoke very little English, English, but she was strong, not too old, and apparently a good cook. She was ready to show up the very next day, which was a Saturday. I didn't even have a chance to interview her. She arrived at the building just as I was leaving for synagogue. I introduced myself. I told her I was sure she and my mother would get along very well. That morning, my prayers were more intense than usual, as I repeatedly asked the master of the universe to intervene to make sure everything worked out well with mom and Ibuya. My prayers went unanswered. I arrived home to see mom sitting on the lobby couch, scowling at Iboyo with a look that bordered on loathing. Good Shabbos on you, how are you? Borzosto, I will feel much better when this kurva goes home. Tell her to go home. She said all this while glaring at Iboyo, who looked like she was no longer surprised at being called a kurva. I make your mother nice lunch and she love it i didn't love it i did not have lunch look at her look at those sagging breasts so big if she leans over they fall into the soup who has who has breasts so so large she looks like a cow from posto tell her to go home tell her to go to uh, 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 Iboya, would you like to uh, take a break sure she left and mom thanked me for getting rid of her I hope she never comes back. She has to come back. Somebody has to stay with you tonight. They do? Yes, they do. You'll be safe. I'll be less nervous. Let me take you upstairs. You can have a nap and Iboya will be back later. I'm exhausted and I want to rest. See you tomorrow. I was consentedly dreaming when suddenly awakened by a frantic banging on the door. Three hours and the kurva still not back. Iboya didn't come back? No. She was supposed to come back. I was told she was very reliable. I hope she's all right. I'm going to call the agency later tonight to find out what happened. Maybe she had an accident. She's too fat to have an accident. Later, I did catch up with Iboya. Why didn't you come back from your break? 
I did come back. Your mother say that I am fired. I try to open door. She starts screaming. She throw my purse in the hallway. She slam door. She say, if I knock again, she call RCMP and tell them that I am spy. Iboya was the last of the Hungarians. Iboya said, I told her, it's your son who hired me. Mom said, then go to his house and take care of him. Thank you very much. That's the uh, completion of the formal part of the uh, presentation. I'd be delighted to take uh, any uh, questions from, uh, from anybody. The rabbi, you'll, you'll handle the uh, questions. I don't sure. listen. Yeah, like, I'm happy. Like 25 to of you, not all, not all together, not, not all uh, at the same time, uh, one at a time. Uh, I'm happy to handle them. By the way, I should also mention, I, th I we may have discussed it, that another commonality, of course, is that both of my parents were Holocaust survivors and my my father spent one day in Auschwitz um, on a transit between two camps. So uh, so uh, not exactly the same stories, but uh, yeah. but I understand from where you come. And who would like to, any questions? Any questions? Any questions about uh, Montreal maybe as well? I know there's some Montreal people online. Who's there? Who are some of the people from uh, Montreal? Lillian, but Lillian's who's here, for, she's watching, she's heard me do my presentation a number of times. She's from Montreal. Um, and I, I mentioned that she is the one who, um, and Gl Glenda, we're gonna get to Gl Glenda next for her question. Uh, the way I started writing was, I was in high school and Lillian was extremely worried that we wouldn't do well in the English class. So she wanted to uh, study Macbeth with me. And uh, I said, okay. And I went over to her house and we started reading Macbeth and Lillian did such a bad job of reading Macbeth. It was so appalling and so awful that I decided to write a satire of Macbeth, which I submitted to the high school paper. The reaction was so good that I decided that instead of what I'd wanted to do, I wanted to be a child psychiatrist, given my mother, you can understand why. Uh, I wanted to be a child psychiatrist, but after that session with Lillian, I said, never mind, the kids will have to find somebody else to help them. Uh, I'm going to become a, a writer and a journalist. So she, in fact, was the inspiration. So I think it was Glenda who had a question uh, next. No, I was just putting my hand up because I'm from Montreal originally, and I actually grew oh, up cool. listening. Uh, I grew up listening to you on CJAD. Um, oh, wow, great. Yeah, and my father's also a Holocaust survivor, but from Lithuania. Um, I wanted to know, when did your mother pass away, and when or why, when and why did you decide then to write the book about your relationship with her? Okay, very good question. First of all, I uh, decided to write the book way wow. before. I was writing the book when she was absolutely fine. And she, uh, she, I live in an apartment building on the third floor. She used to live on the 12th floor. And she'd come down uh, and I always kept the door open. I didn't lock it because in case she wanted to come in, I wanted her to just push the door open. I didn't want her to feel excluded at, at any time. So she'd always come and say, surprise visit, surprise visit. And she'd come in and sit in her chair and I'm sitting where you're see, seeing me now. And the chair is like a few feet, like. 15 feet away, she'd sit in her chair and she said, what are you doing? I said, I'm, I'm writing, I'm writing a book. I'm gonna write a book about you. Yeah, crazy, the, the, I'm not interesting. You, you can't write a book about me, but she's wrong, uh, I could, because uh, there are a lot of interesting uh, stories. And occasionally I would just listen to her talking while she was sitting in her chair as she slowly got older and developed dementia. I take down what she wrote, just take down and part of it got into the book. And um, whenever I'd go visit her after when she, after she had no longer take care of herself and she was in the Jewish elder care in, in Montreal, when I'd visit her every Friday uh, afternoon and every Sunday. And whenever I'd leave, because I'd be so worried, God forbid, what happens? How am I gonna survive if anything happens to her? Um, she'd always say to me, whenever I leave, have a good life, have a good life. So I was writing the book the whole time and I had no ending to it. And what happened is mom, when I was in, whenever I'd go away out of town, she'd know it without me telling her, she'd know it and would get sick. And then I'd have to 
to, to come back. And I had no ending. And what did she do? She passed away, providing me with the ending, uh, ending for the book, which I, I hope is a great tribute to everything that she did in her, her life and, and what she inspired in me and uh, hopefully what she uh, inspired in, in, in other people as well. Please. Yes, uh, Leah. Leah Mills, can I mute Herb. yourself? Herb. Yeah. Herb, can you unmute, please? Hi. Can you hear me? Hi. Yes, I can. Okay. You, uh, you, you said very little about your father. I'm just curious if you could summarize in a few words what your father's experience was like being the husband of your mother. <laughs> That's a fa that's an absolutely fabulous uh, question. Um, the two of them were really a, a, a meeting of, of the minds. Whatever one had, the other one did. Now, he was also a survivor. He was in, in Matthausen. She was the stellar, sparkling personality. He was much more calm uh, and, and down to earth. Um, he was a rabbi. And as a rabbi, to give you an example, um, he, he could never bring himself to ask for for a, a fee or money to perform a, a wedding or a, um, a to do a bar mitzvah or, and, and by the way, my father, he could teach a Haftarah to a monkey uh, and they would know it by the end of it. His, his patience was un unbelievable, but she wouldn't ask for, he wouldn't ask for any money. He did whatever he did and money was not his thing. When a bill arrived or anything official arrived, he'd hand it to her. She was in charge of anything to do with um, finances, and uh, she was she she was the one who did all that, and that um, kept. He was the spiritual one. She was the more material one. If not for her, we might not have had, like he would never have asked anybody for for any money. Now listen to this story uh, when he conduct, to give you an example of how did this man get along with her. First of all, he was very proud of her to take her to any event. She was gorgeous and glamorous. She looked like uh, Elizabeth Taylor. There, there's a picture in the book of her. Wait, I can show you. I can show you right now. Um, um, You see the picture of those two women? Yes. Right? yes. The one on the uh, right is mom. The other one is Elizabeth Taylor. Well, I she thought it was pictures. the other way. You know what? I thought she it was the other pictures. way around. Okay. She would take pictures of herself where she looked like the stars. Now, if you look at the other picture, uh, you will see at the top a picture of mom and Elizabeth Taylor again, both of them wearing fur coats, right? That's how I saw the picture in the scrapbook. And if you look at this, the picture of Elizabeth Taylor is a newspaper clipping. When I lifted the clipping, guess who was underneath? Me. <laughs> that was our visit to New York. She covered up me and put Elizabeth Taylor on top of me to see how the two of them look together. So now, uh, what was I telling you the story about uh, how they uh, got along? So my father would conduct a funeral he wouldn't want to ask for anything. So he'd come home and my mother said, how much did uh, Mrs. Goldstein pay you for the funeral? Did Mrs. Goldstein pay you for the funeral? Yes, yes, of course. And uh, he took out a hundred dollars, this was back then, and gave it, gave it to her. And she, and she said, isn't that interesting? Because she was here this morning and gave me a hundred dollars. So she knew that he was uh, lying. He didn't want to incur her wrath. So he would occasionally borrow money from me to, in case somebody didn't give him anything. He didn't want to ask them for anything, but he didn't want to face her wrath. So he'd borrow the money from me. I'd give him the money and then uh, he'd give it to, to her. But it, it, so that, that's how the two of them uh, got along. He was just a very kind soul. And I'd want to give him money. Listen to what I had to do. And I'll talk about this when we do the son of a rabbi business. Uh, uh, when I'd want to give him money, when he'd come over to my apartment and he'd go home, like he'd occasionally argue with my mother and then he'd hang out with me. So I got to go, I got to go. I said, why, why are you leaving? He says, 
he missed her so much, like he couldn't be without her. And we went to Toronto once, um, and I'm bringing home mom from Toronto. Uh, I rented a limousine, so we arrived by limousine. It arrives in front. My father's already outside on the front porch. I don't exist. Doesn't see me. Doesn't say hello to me. Just sees her and is like, like so happy that she's finally come back. Uh, finally come back after two days in Toronto. It's as if you know she'd gone for a year. I said, hello, daddy. Hello, me. Uh, uh, I'm here too. Hello, 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 hello. So that's how um, they uh, got along. They were, they were like a perfect uh, match. He, he'd help. Um, he was, like I said, the spiritual one. She was the, the one who helped make sure that everything was done. All the finances uh, were, were arranged. And um, they got along quite well. It was, it was a nice meeting and they missed, uh, missed each other. One day I was so they were having an argument. Don't forget, they're both Hungarian, right? So they're very volatile. And when they have an argument, and the Hungarian language is not like any other language. When I'm having a normal conversation, people think I'm having an argument. They don't understand what a Hungarian argument sounds like. So one day, my parents were having a Hungarian argument. It was nasty. It was mean. Hungarian is a very deep, eloquent language. And when you want to say something insulting to the other person, you can go to great depth. And they're fighting and fighting. I, I don't know what I'm going to do. They look like the two of them that they're going to kill each other. What am I going to do? I take a cab. I feel so bad that they might actually do something to each other that I tell the cab halfway to my apartment downtown, turn around, we have to go back. I come back and the cab is parked right near my the duplex they live in. And I see the two of them. My father's sitting on the back balcony and my mother's coming and asking if he'd like green grapes or red grapes. I'm in the wrong house. They look like they're going to attack each other like 10 minutes ago. And now, dear, would you like the red grapes or the green grapes? Like they up, down, like very volatile. Boundaries was obviously not a big issue for, for mom uh, under the circumstances. But like a second generation from your parents, what you get, you get the good, you get the bad, you are who you are because of uh because of them because of what they went through and obviously they did the best that they could but as a couple they were really quite the match he got a go gorgeous glamorous woman who uh handled all of the finances and she got a guy who was loving and and loyal and treated her like royalty her uh entire life so that's how he managed that's how he managed to get along with a uh, with a uh, uh, a woman like that Thank you. Oh, by the way, one of the things when he had a Passover Seder, we had a Passover Seder for the community, like a communal Seder at the synagogue. And um, um, my father would start, you know, he was leading the Seder and, and everything. And then all the Hungarians who hadn't seen each other for a while, they're having a fantastic time schmoozing. They're not paying any attention. They're talking to each other, having a wonderful time, enjoying the Seder. And my father said, uh, if there's no quiet, I start from the beginning. Uh, and then they and then they managed to then they managed to uh, quiet down. So uh, they got they, they did very well. It was my mother who who changed the price of the tickets for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. My father says you can't increase the price, and my mother says don't don't worry, I vote. And then behind his back, she jacked up the uh, price. That's what she did behind his back. What he did behind her back, somebody couldn't pay. He said they paid. So uh, between the the two of them, they were they were quite quite the pair. Any other, uh, great question, thank you. A any other uh, questions? Sounds like your mother was the executive director of the synagogue. Is that oh, 100%, 100%. So by the way, oh, another okay. similarity. One, oh. one quick thing, my father had a 15 year contract with the little shtibel that he started, right? He bought the building and then he gave it to his board of directors and they hired him to a 15 year contract. His 15 year contract lasted 35 years. Very nice. You know, I, I was thinking of another similarity is your mother was the wife of a, of a rabbi and, and looked like a movie star. I'm a rabbi and my wife looks like a movie star. So it's... Uh... Hey, there you go. <laughs> by, by the way, by what, my mother would always say, she says, when they call her Rebetzin, she says, I am not a Rebetzin. I am the wife of the rabbi. I am not a Rebetzin. I've, I want to just make a, a, first of all, thank you. 
a couple announcements, and then I have one last question for you, Tommy. Sure. Uh, on a serious note. Um, so, so my my thank you, of course, is to Tommy for for joining us, and um, and I want to also I know that your book is available on Amazon, right? Yes. We want to we want to thank you. We want to thank Harold for for allowing us to spend this hour with you and giving us uh, an hour with you tonight. Um, so thank you to thank him. You. Um, and we want to um, we want to also just remind you of a couple upcoming programs. First of all, um, this is not something that's been advertised yet, really. But I'm gonna just I'm gonna share screen our website for a second, if I can. Um, there's a, I, I want you to know that we are, we are participating in a communal program, um, in a memorial service for the 250 children whose bodies were, were found um, in Kamloops. And, and that's gonna be Friday at 10.45 a.m. And it's the, the all of the synagogues in, in Vancouver are participating at VTT. So please join us for what will be a, a very meaningful uh, event uh, and a memorial, I should say. Um, and it will be live streamed, so you can just um, follow. It will be you'll be able to find it on our YouTube webs on our YouTube channel. I, I want to call your attention to this pr program, which is our program for next week. It's not officially a primetime BI because it's being done in conjunction with Shari Zedek. Um, Natasha, who is our who is our infectious disease expert for our COVID-19 committee and has already done some excellent programs, is going to be um, is going to be joining in with Dr. Kimmel, who is on this equal the same committee for Shari Tzedek, and they're going to be and they both work at St. Paul's and they're going to be discussing COVID-19. That's next Thursday, not next Wednesday. And finally, it's not up yet, but the following Wednesday. Um, which is uh, on the fortnight, we will be will be joined by a very old friend of mine, a rabbi and a psychologist, Dr. Paul Shrell Fox, who actually was a, has his own personal um, has works per privately and has also worked for Tzahal as a Tzahal as an Israeli in the Israeli Defense Force for as a psychiatrist, and he's a rabbi, a psychiatrist in Israel, and he's going to be joining us. Uh, for to discuss the, what it's been like psychologically for us, emotionally and psychologically for humanity during COVID-19. So please join us for that. I, I want to finish tonight on, on with one last question. As a, as a synagogue rabbi and, who's dealt with Holocaust survivors and as the child of Holocaust survivors, I have seen that um, that what often happened is that for survivors, the Shoah was an anvil of someone's natural personality. In other words, mm -hmm. it doesn't seem to me that it, it, it turned mean people into nice people or nice people into mean people, but it turned nice menschlichkeit people into even nicer people and people who may not have been the nice, whatever it is, it, you know, people who may have been funny have been so funnier. Do you, in your experience, I assume that, you know, both with your parents and what are clear, definitive um, characters and, and with their friends who are survivors, did you, do, do, would you say that you've actually experienced that as well? Or, or would you, um, what's your opinion on, on that, that theory? Well, actually, I I, I think that you're absolutely uh, correct. It's not a there was not a transfer or a change of personality. It's an intensification of personality. If they were daring before, they became daring. Uh, they were daring uh, after. If they were shy before, they became more reticent. Uh, it, it intensified wh whatever there whatever there was. But um, uh, and they said that the people who uh, who survived were not the toughest ones or the stronger ones, it turned out to be the ones who had a purpose. In other words, there was a re the ones who sort of gave up, it was the ones who had a, a purpose. And uh, I think uh, my, my mother's purpose was to, to reunite with 
who was left of her family because Greza told her that her parents were gone, but that her siblings may still be alive. And my father's purpose was, he thought it was extremely important. His purpose was to that the people who died not be forgotten. And his shul was called Beth Hazikoran. And they, what he did is he put up plaques. Uh, he buried a lot of the people right after the, the Holocaust and, and did set cottage for them. And he put up plaques in the synagogue in his little shtibel, his small synagogue. He put up plaques in their name, like of many of the parents of, the, of his members. And he put up plaques in their name. It was very important for him to do that. And so the reason that many of the people who came to my father's synagogue were Hungarians, they were, after the war, they believed in nothing. They believed they did not want to go to synagogue. They did not want to set foot in the synagogue. They had enough of all that. Because he spoke Hungarian, because the speech was in Hungarian at, during the services, the drusha, the speech was in Hungarian, it felt like home. So that's why that that's why they they came, and this the importance of that memory was so important is when my father after the thirty five year old thirty five year contract Rabbi Infeld that I mentioned before, when they were absorbed by another synagogue, my father said, the Torah scrolls can go to the new synagogue no problem, the building can go to them no problem, whatever the money is uh, that the synagogue is going to get is fine. There's one thing that is a deal breaker. All of the plaques, every name that is up here on a plaque on the wall in this list, all of them, as is, have to be somewhere in the new synagogue. I'm not going to, in the synagogue, the bigger one they amalgamated with. I'm not going to tell you where you have to put it, but it has to be there. And the Hebrekadisha synagogue on Clan Ranald in Montreal. Uh, as you come in the main entrance, if you go to the left, we're towards where the bride's room is for weddings, the entire wall from the one door to the next is the name of the Hungarian Holocaust survivors. That was extremely important to him that they not be for, uh, forgotten. So that's the character he was when he was in his 20s and 30s before the Holocaust, and that was his character after. So Rabbi, and, and my mother was my mother had long, long hair down to her waist. Her father was so furious with her. He was ultra orthodox. He cut her hair because he was so angry at her because she ended up going to a movie to see Madame Bovary when she was young. So she was there, had chutzpah and rebelliousness even as 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 a as a teenager, and she used that to good stead in order to survive Auschwitz, to survive the Hungarian Revolution. A quick last story: during the in order to survive in communist Hungary, there wasn't enough food to last for the whole month. So she had to deal in contraband uh, American dollars, American silver dollars, and one day a neighbor reported her. So as the, as the police, the Hungarian uh, secret police were coming down the cor corridor, she took all of the silver dollars she had and she threw them quickly into my diaper pail. And they arrive in and they said, we heard that you are dealing in, in contraband Hungarian dollars. I said, yes, of course. I look like a very rich woman who would deal in contraband. Maybe I took 300 silver dollars and put them all in that diaper pail. Why don't you look? It's right over there. Why don't you check, see if the 300 silver dollars are right there? My father's hair goes white because the 300 silver dollars are there, right? They're, they're right there. And she's pointing, go ahead, check it right there. It could be, they're just underneath there. $300, one under, a whole pile of them right there. And the woman says, oh, big mouth, the, the, the Hungarian secret police are, oh, big, big mouth. A big, big mouth. You watch your mouth. Your your wife has a big mouth. He says to my father, and they leave. So she took these chances because she feared she's going to get caught anyway, right? That there was this. What's the worst that's going to happen? Uh, is going to get caught anyway. So she's going to quote unquote roll the dice, like when she had a seventeen and asked for the the next card for for the for the four. So like I said, all of these qualities were there, Rabbi, as you said beforehand. They just became more intense. Like a gregarious person beforehand would not become a shy person afterward. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Great audience. I loved looking at you. You're very responsive during the whole time. 
I loved it. Very warm, welcoming congregation in Vancouver. I can't wait one day to go see you in person. Now, wait a second. It's not over. Uh, the rabbi's son and I are going to be doing a special presentation on what it's like to be a rabbi's son. Uh, that's going to come that's, up. Uh, that's, coming up. Out. That, that's going to come up sometime soon. Thank you all for joining me. Have a wonderful Thanks day. for the warm welcome. Wonderful evening. Feel free to say hello. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Susan Tommy. and Arnold and Michael and Marty and Patricia and Joanne and Bob and Karen and Sylvie and Adam and Harley and Vinny and uh, Lily Tommy. and Mary. Yes. Can I say Chris and I'm safe, Ben? Oh, thank you. Who's, who's speaking to me in Hungarian? <laughs> Diane. I, uh, it says Adam Stein, but it's not. It's Diane. Hi, Diane. Excellent. Uh, so, you speak excellent Hungarian. Yeah, I, I don't speak much more than that, but my family are all from Romania. I do speak Romanian, but my mom's side were Hungarian Romanians, so they speak Hungarian. Their accent is absolutely spot on. I felt like I was in a room full of my people. It was really oh, fantastic. Great. Thank, Thank you. you so much. I'm glad you felt that way. Thank you. It's yeah. Great. Thank you. Wonderful. Wonderful crowd. Wonderful uh, audience. You have a great rabbi, and rabbi, you have a great congregation. Thank you. Thank you. I agree with the second part. <laughs> have <a wonderful>, <laughs> thank you. Have a wonderful night. Good night. All the best. Take care. Good night. Good Bye. night, everybody. Good night.